an incredible amount of time goes into every service. Uh, you just you have no idea of of the time and effort that goes into into one Sunday morning. Uh, just the, the the praise and worship team practices and and then all the, the time spent on the video or, or, or on my presentation as I bring uh, the word to you. You know, and, and this not, that's not counting the study and, uh, and all the time of, uh, that, that goes into it. There's an incredible amount of time that goes into one Sunday service here. And it just bothers me when, uh, when something flips it around. You know, and it kind of makes what we've tried so desperately to acquire and to achieve uh, second class. I don't like second. Okay. But I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. God's going to bless you mightily, I promise you, for, for, for coming today. Uh, uh, how many is glad that God is praying you through? And that Lord is, the Lord is leading you as, because somebody is praying you through? You know, Jesus ever lives to do what? Make intercessions for us. He is praying you through. Uh, people are praying you through. And things are happening good in your life because people are praying. And when crazy things happen and when bad things happen, and I promise you it's still because of prayer that good stuff is going to happen for you. Before I get started in my message, just a couple of thoughts quickly. Uh, my life group that we're starting is starting tonight. It, uh, we'll start right here at 6 o'clock. And uh, right back there in my study is where we'll, we'll, we'll attempt to, to uh, assimilate. So at 6 o'clock, if you'd like to come and we'll just hang out together, uh, you got some questions or whatever that you'd like to ask me, uh, talk to me about, spend time with me, then come. Make it fun. Make it a challenge for me. All right, see if you can come up with something I can't, I can't uh, handle. But uh, come and, uh, and let's spend some time together. We'll talk about the, the, the lesson. We'll spend time together. But mostly this is for people that just, you know, haven't been here a long time and kind of want to have some, have some wonders and questions about, about LifeGate, maybe our doctrine, how we do things, why we do things the way we do it. And, you know, let's spend time together. So come and make it a challenge for me. And, uh, and we'll have a good time. Another thing I want to mention, too, is don't forget about the uh, workshops that we're doing on Wednesday nights. Uh, they're starting at 7 o'clock. We have the prophetic workshop. Miss Judy's doing it, that one in here. Terry's doing the Daniel 70-week eschatology-type workshop back there. Lance, Pastor Lance is doing one down in the building down here. It's called the King's Castle Workshops, Getting Prepared to Reach the Children in this region for, uh, for a vacation Bible school type thing, and I'm doing a parenting workshop. So if that's interesting to you, you didn't come this week, last week, and you missed something good, and maybe you can come this week. So we just invite you to come, come to that. Okay. Well, we're, we're doing our... our our, our Sermon on the Mount series. And today's lesson is, is from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. So let me go ahead and read that to you. Matthew 6, 13 says this, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, King James Version says from evil. But a better translation of that is from the evil one. Now, we're doing the Sermon on the Mount series, and it's called Living in the Kingdom. This is the series that we're doing, and we're right about in the middle of the, of the Sermon on the Mount right now. And right in the middle of the greatest sermon ever told was the greatest prayer ever prayed. And so we've been spending about eight weeks just on the prayer, and we've gone through each part, and all of these images that you see on either side of the screen, all of those images are representations of one particular thought that Jesus gave us in that Sermon on the Mount. And today's lesson is, of course, Deliver Us. It's the 21st message that we've done on the Sermon on the Mount, Deliver Us. So if you'll turn in your Bibles, and, you know, I've got a couple of passages that I really want you to turn to. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6 to start with and be there, and I'll be there in just a little while. But Ephesians 6, I'd like for you to look at that one, and then uh, I think I want you to also to turn to John chapter 5. And I'll be there, I'll be there shortly. No, 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 let's, like, let's make that, instead of John 5, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, that'll be good. Okay, let's pray. Father, help us now. Uh, let, us, let us just uh, enjoy this time together. Speak to us, Lord. Let these things that you're about to tell us minister to us and help us. Anoint our ears that we can hear what the Spirit says. Let us see in your word, your written holy word, something that we can make applicable to our lives that we can utilize for the kingdom of heaven and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
what is your personal position of the evil one? Now, let me explain what I'm, what I'm talking about. See, the, the devil is real, and he's personal. Hear how I'm saying it? He's personal. He's not some sort of impersonal cosmic force that's out there in the great distance that will never touch your life. As, as I've been all of these years in, in both ministry and church, um, I find two extremes that believers walk in. One extreme is, is that they barely believe in the devil. They borderline acknowledging his reality. Um, they feel like that if there is a devil, he won't get me. And so we borderline that. We think that maybe if we start talking about the devil too much, that we're getting too spooky spiritual. That, uh, that you know, that's too churchy. You know, I don't want to go off the deep end here. So that's one, one area, one extreme. The other extreme is totally opposite. It's where everything is the devil. You know, where he's behind every bush. There's a big bad devil behind every bush. And everything becomes the devil. Uh, he, uh, he uh, you know, every negative thing in our life, if it rains on Sunday, it's the devil. If, uh, if something happens wrong in our life, it's the devil. And we began blaming the devil for everything in that extremism. Now, now, the problem with that extremism that everything is of the devil is that we never deal with our hearts. We never deal with our flesh. And, and, we, and we blame everything on the devil rather than really looking at our own lives and seeing what we're causing and what we're bringing about in, in life. At LifeGate, at LifeGate uh, I fear we take too little emphasis on the devil. I, and, I, and I feel that way for a couple of reasons. One reason that I feel that way is because, is because we preach the kingdom of heaven. We preach the kingdom of God with a mighty loving father, the creator, the almighty God, who loves you so much. We preach a mighty Lord Jesus. We preach big God, right? He's, he's a mighty Lord and a powerful Holy Spirit. And we do that here. And, and so, but let me ask you a question. Does doing that, does preaching a big God make the devil any smaller? No. Just because God is big doesn't make the devil little. Um, Jesus said that in the perfect prayer, the Lord's prayer, there has to be, there should be, there is a place to pray about the devil, to pray about the evil one. If we're praying correctly, a part of our prayer life is about him, is about the evil one. Not just about the temptations that we go through, but the evil one himself. Jesus believed in a real devil. Jesus believed in a real evil one. And he talked about him frequently in his teachings. Now, we can't do a complete teaching today on the devil. We can't do a, a, a great expository teaching here in our time together. We'll save that for another time. But I do need to make you aware of some issues, make us aware of some things, because it is imperative that we recognize the evil one and how he operates. You have got to be able to recognize the devil and how he operates as he comes to your life, as he approaches you. You've got to be able to know what to do when he does. And, and this is what I really want to emphasize. So let's get started. And let's see if I can help you understand how the evil one operates a little bit. So let's start with, let's go to the Revelation. That'd be good. You like the book of Revelation? Let's look at the names of the evil one. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 9, we see some names, or the names that are used in the New Testament of, of the, this evil one. In Revelation 12, 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, this is kind of an overview scripture, so I'm just using it as an overview, because from it we can see several things in that verse about the devil. First of all, there has been a war in heaven. 
Now, the reason I'm saying it this way with, a, with an emphasis is there has been a war in heaven. As much theology today tries to tell us that there will be one day a war in heaven. Uh, the theology that mostly we hear is, is that there's going to be one day a great tribulation. And in the great tribulation, when all this is going on, that's when Satan is thrown down to the earth. And it's the, when he's thrown down to the earth that we have this seven years of great tribulation. That's basically the theology that most of us were brought up in. But Jesus said that's not accurate. Jesus said that war has already happened. And it's necessary that you, that you know that it's already happened. And in Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, here is what Jesus says as he had sent out the, the 70. Uh, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he, Jesus, said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, when, when did Jesus say this? Give me a year. About A.D. 30? Yeah. Satan had fallen from heaven back then when Jesus brought the kingdom to earth. When Jesus began the kingdom of heaven, when Jesus began sending out people with the power and authority of the Holy Ghost in their lives, Satan fell. And he was cast to earth. Now the point that I'm trying to make here is that we've got to know that he is alive and he's doing well on earth. Now, we've got a bigger God, but I just want to make certain that we don't underemphasize the devil today. This is what this, Jesus says you need to realize that there is an, an evil one and that he, he is here and that he is in the earth. So the first point that I want to make sure that we see is that he is here. Now, there we also see from this passage several names of the devil. We see he is the uh, great dragon, he's the old serpent, he's the devil, he's Satan. Why so many names? Well, see, in the Bible, when the Bible gives us names, uh, it, it, it also is talking about a nature. Names in the Bible is not just a face, but they mean the nature of that name. So as we look at Satan's or, or the devil or the dragon, or if you look at, at what their names mean, we see their natures. He, we see the evil one's nature. First of all, he's the great dragon. Let me show you this one in the, in the Hebrew. Dracon. And it means a great serpent, and attach that with the word serpent, Ophis, which with the ancients, the serpent was the emblem of cunning, wisdom, and deceit. So when we're talking about the great dragon, and we're talking about the serpent, when we're talking about this guy here, what we're talking about is a master of cunning. We're, we're talking here about uh, a, a, an individual, an a, a entity, a, a nature that is, is intricate and appears limitless in his ability to cun us. He is, he is so slick. He's wisdom. He's, his wisdom is great. He is the great dragon. Now, I want to make this statement. In and of ourselves, we are no match for him. If, if you go through life and you don't think he will bite you and destroy you, if you just stay in and of yourself, you are deceived. Say it again, in and of ourselves, we are no match for his cunning and for his wisdom. Now, if Christ is in you, if you are in Christ, if the blood of Jesus is in your life, you're in good shape. Now, let me, let me, let me keep going here. Uh, what's interesting to me about the devil, about the serpent, about the, the great dragon and all these guys, what's interesting to me is that he is so cunning, he can take what a person knows is wrong and still get him to do it or get her to do it. Satan can come to you with something that you know you shouldn't do and get you to do it. Let's look at the word devil in the Hebrew and the Greek. Diablos, prone to slander, slanderous. Now, the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. I want to hit this just a little bit. You see, when we slander, when we talk about people, we're not just being devilish. We are as the devil. We are accusing the brothers. We're not just being used by him. We are in his kingdom. We are allowing him 
to use us and expose himself through us. The word Satan, Greek word Satan, Satanus, means invites apostasy from God into sin. Satan will do his best to get you to turn from God. He will find something in your life, something during your walk with Jesus to turn you. He will use people. He, he will use time. He will use emotions. He will use lust. He will, he will get you mad at someone or someone mad at you. He will come at you cunningly and cause you to turn from God. Now, most of us at LifeGate, at one point in time, have done that. We turned, but thank be unto Jesus, we came back. Most of us will experience this, where we will literally turn from God. The Bible warns us to be cautious of this entity, this evil one. Uh, now, you know, I know that we all, we all think we're big and bad, and he, he won't get me, and, 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 and I'm bigger than him, or I'm better than him, or I'm smarter than him. But I want to say it again. Listen, in and of ourselves, we are no match for the evil one. Uh, he is the master. We sang the song, the master of deceit, the master of evil. Jude warns us about him. And if you want to turn to this, you can. It's going to be on the screen, of course. But in Jude chapter 1 and verse 8, Jude warns us about not taking not just the devil, but angelic celestial beings seriously. Let me, let me read this to you. Jude 1 8 says this. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men, now watch this, these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. What do they speak abusively about? Whatever they do not understand and things they do understand. It's not just the things they don't understand, but what they do understand, they still speak abusively about it. By instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. What destroys them? Leave that up there just a second. What destroys them? Pardon? Things they don't understand, things they do understand, but mostly their mouths speaking and not giving proper knowledgement of the evil one, our celestial beings. See, it, it becomes imperative. It becomes so important that we understand this. And it's not like, you know, and I, I struggle with, with trying to how to say this because I, I, I really hate this part of today's message, but, but it's not like you want to respect the devil, but you better. You better recognize he will destroy you. We don't give him a place, but we recognize that he is the master of deceit. Uh, the evil one is to be taken seriously. He can, and if at all possible, he will destroy your life. He masquerades. Let me show you how he works. I've given you enough now about who he is and, and his, 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 his nature. Now I want to show you how he works. Um, the evil one and his agents, agents are masters of disguise. Now we think of fallen angels as these creatures with wings and feathers uh, and those kinds of things. That, that, that's, that's, not, that's not the way it works. Um, they masquerade, spirits masquerade to get to us. And they appear in any form. 
they will appear to you in the thing or things or persons that you love the most. I want you to really, really, he's not, I want to say this now and I'll say it again in a minute, but Satan's not going to show up in your life with slanted eyes and a forked tail. He's not going to show up with red skin. He's not going to show up repulsively to you. He's going to show up in a way to allure you and to attract you. Let me, let me show you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13, Paul here talks about this some. And he says here in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, 13, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading, as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Now leave that up. Leave that up. How does Satan masquerade? As an angel of light. How does his ser servants masquerade in that particular verse? The servants of righteousness. Satan, the devil, the great dragon, will come to us in a masquerading way. He's not going to come with slanted eyes and a forked tail and a pitchfork. He's not going to come with red skin and scales. He's going to come to you at what brings you light in your life. Uh, one of the primary ways, hear this please, one of the primary ways the evil one works is through false doctrine. I mean, that's what Paul is really saying here. Paul is saying here that one way that Satan will come is through false apostles, false teachers, false doctrine. Listen, it is imperative, it is more than imperative, that you stay and find a, a church that really teaches the truth and that stays in the Word of God and that, and that, and that, and that you, can, you know because you can read and you study yourself, you know that it's truth. If not, you will be deceived. This is Paul's warning here. See, a primary way Satan shows up is through doctrine. Now, he will use anything. He will use the thing you love the most and masquerade as that to get entrance into our lives. He'll approach you with temptations. That's why Jesus says, pray this first. Father, lead us not into temptations. We need to be aware of our temptations. He will approach us with temptations. And as he approaches us with that bottle or that pill or that person in that dress or that person in that suit or he approaches us with anger or calmness he baits us he will show up in Baghdad Afghanistan or Washington DC he masquerades and he approaches us If at all possible, he will destroy us. He will show up, if at all possible, in you. If at all possible, he'll show up in me. He showed up in Peter. Right in the face of Jesus. Here stands Satan in Peter, an apostle. Let me show you. Matthew 16, 23. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. 
hear me, Satan used something close to Jesus to try to turn the path of Jesus. If you're familiar with, the, with that passage, what Jesus has just done is told them that he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to be beaten, he was going to be taken and whipped, he was going to be hung on a cross, he was going to die, and he was going to raise the third day. Peter grabs him and says, not so, Lord. See, what Satan will do is use something close to us to try to turn us from the path that God wants us to go down to fulfill his will, to accomplish his purpose, to bring the kingdom. Later, Satan would use Judas. Again, someone close to Christ. Okay. Uh, let me say this. Some people think the devil is out to kill them. You ever heard that? He's, the devil's out to kill them. No, no. That's not necessarily true. Most folks are more advantageous to him alive than dead. For example, a slanderer, if a person is a slanderer, he w he'll do much more work for the kingdom of darkness alive than dead. So it's not that he's necessarily out to kill you, but he is out to destroy you, to devour your life to stop you from accomplishing in the kingdom of heaven what God so desires and has anointed you and ordained you to accomplish. Now, here's my primary point for today. I want to make sure that, that we get this point. Time's running out, and I need to make sure we get this one. The evil one has an individual plan to trap each of us. Let me say it again. The evil one has an individual plan just made for you. He has one just made for me. Jesus says, when you pray, pray, lead us not into our temptations, to the things that tempt me, but deliver me from evil. This is the primary thought that Jesus is, pro is projecting to us, is, is that the enemy has a plan for your evil and not your good. I want to show you this. Uh, I think that this is probably the primary thing that believers don't realize, and because they don't realize that there is a plan that Satan has for each of us to take us out, to destroy us, that we really fall into messes. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. You got your Bible there at Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. Now, what's happening in Ephesians is Paul is telling us to put on the armor of God, armor up. Breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he's telling us to armor up, to get ready. Ready for what? What, what do we put on the armor of God? For, for what do we put on the armor of God? What is the purpose of it? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that. Say so that. Say, say, that. say it real loud. So that. So that. So that. There you go. You can take your stand against what? The devil's schemes. He has a scheme for you. If you'll look, leave that, leave that verse up there, please. Note this, that it's a personal verse. The understood subject here is you. You put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. This is a personal verse. It means that you need to armor up so that you can stand against his scheme, his plan for you. The Apostle Paul is telling us that the devil has a scheme of attack for you and a scheme of attack for me. I have... My own plan. The devil has his own plan for me. Let, me. let me explain this to you. See, what may entice me or allure me may not entice or allure you. He is the, the, the king of cunning. He, he, will, he, will con, he, will, he will come, he will find something that will allure me and bait me and bait by bait and scheme by scheme and little by little he allure me, allures me into the trap of destruction. And his primary purpose is to turn me from the path that God has for me to accomplish the kingdom. 
to waylay me, to get me off track, to get me onto something else, get me into a place where I can be destroyed. Let's look at that word scheme in the, in the Greek. It's the Greek word methodia. We get our English word method from it. And that's exactly what it means. It's method. He has a method, a scheme, a method to get you, to get me, to get each of us. And what we wore him off with is the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, praying, uh, uh, the sword of the spirit, feet shall with preparation of the gospel of peace. These are the things that we're able to war off him with. What it means also is, is that it's, it's, it's the thought of cunning, cunning art, deceit, craft, trickery. See, the scheme that the evil one has for each of us is amazing. It's specifically crafted, cunningly art, cunningly crafted for each of us to trick us. It's a crafted plan. It's not haphazardly thrown together. This thing, he wants, he, wants us, he wants us to think that his kingdom is in disarray and that his kingdom, listen, that thing has been around a long time. It is methodical. It is methodized. And notice, please, that it's not there to kill us, but to trick us. It's not there to destroy us as in dying but to destroy our lives and that we won't accomplish the kingdom. Um, His scheme is specifically designed for each of us. So little by little and bait by bait and by temptation by temptation, uh, pill by pill, bottle by bottle, lust by lust, Dress by dress, pants by pants, whatever that it is, he baits us until we fall into the snare, into the pit. And that's the way he works. And it works amazingly well. Let me tell you how well it works. There's not a person looking at me right now. There's not a person looking at me right now who does not know how Satan comes to you. But most of the time, we do exactly what he baits us with. It's amazing. Most of the time, we're not strong enough to resist it. That's why it's important to keep that armor on, keep our salvation on, our righteousness on, to stay in a place. It's amazing how well it works. Now, with the understanding that I've just given to you, that there is a deceitful scheme to bait you, to lead you to your destruction. Let me read you this passage in 1 Peter 5. You there? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, now the reason that I, that I use this verse is because I have heard 1 Peter 5, 8 taught like this, that the devil is a toothless bully and that supposedly humorously, whoever's preaching it and teaching it says that Jesus pulled all of his teeth. Listen, I've just showed you where Paul says you better armor up. That there is a deceitful scheme just made for you. I have just showed you where, where Peter here says you better be alert all the time. Jesus said it is so serious you need to pray about it on a consistent basis. I want you to know, folks, those kinds of things bother me. When I hear teachers of the word saying that he's a toothless bully... If, if, if you're saying that, you've never been bitten, you know? 
If he ever bites you, he takes a hunk out. He has a plan and a scheme for each one of us and for our demise. He will devour our lives, if at all possible. Now, isn't that great teaching? Aren't you just pumped up now? I mean, aren't you excited? Hallelujah. Come on. We need to be talking in tongues. and just, Boy, this is good stuff. I said all of that to get to this point. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Yes, the evil one is dangerous. Yes, he will eat our lunch. Yes, he, he, we need to recognize what he will do. But here's what I'm really here to tell you today. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm here to tell you today, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what, what trap he set for you. I don't care if it's worked or hasn't worked. What I'm here to tell you today is greater is he that's in you than he that's out there. I want you to see, I want you to turn in your Bible, if you will, to, to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. I just want to show you a thought here. That's where, you know, let me show it to you. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Does anybody in here know what, the, what them is in, in, this, in this passage? Not overcome him, overcome them. Do you know what the context is? That's why I want you to turn to it. Because you, you need to, the context is the Antichrist. Hello, listen to me. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You have overcome them. John wrote this in A.D. 30-something, 40-something, somewhere. Greater is he that's in you than he that's out there. And what I want us to really see is, is that I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what snare, what plan, what scheme the devil has to destroy your life. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Now, there's a balance. We have got to realize that this guy, this evil one, is real. We have got to realize that he will. But I, we've also got to realize that we can have a confidence in our God that I don't care how deep in the pit we get, if we will just cry out to him, deliver me, he will reach down and pull us out, just like I tried to depict on that picture. I don't care what pit you're in. I don't care what's happened in your life. If you have an overwhelming confidence in God, he will deliver you. That's his job. That's what he does. And he does it well. But we, it's our part to cry out, deliver me from the evil one. It's my part to do something to say, God, I need your help. I have messed up. And now listen, if you look at that text correctly, if you look at that, that part there, it says, lead us not into temptations, but, conjunction, deliver us from the evil one. What you see there is he's already got you. Lead us not in two, but deliver us from. If, you're, if we're having to pray, deliver me from the evil one, what that's really saying is he's already got our lives. He's already got us down there. And what we're to do at that time is to yell out to God, God, deliver me. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. See, he is the great I am. He, he is bigger than any problem you've got. What we've got to, to do, people, is stop telling God how big our problems are and start telling our mountains how big our God is. We've got to get to the place where we speak to the mountain. What do you think he's really talking about? He really thinks you're going to go out there and move pigeon? He's, not, he's saying when you've got a problem, when you're in a pit, when there's bad stuff happening in your life, you speak to that thing and you command it to be cast into the sea. And we, we got to be there. Cry out to God and say, deliver me. Deliver me. Listen, God has everything I need to get out of my problem. And if he doesn't have it, he'll create it. Is that right? I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what mess your life is in. I have been in messes. I've been in trouble. I've been in bad places. And when I cry out to God, God will create a way for me out. He does that for us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Let me show you Psalms 18.1. The song of David was written at a time when the Lord had delivered him from his 
little one enemy. What does it say? Many enemies, including Saul. Lord, how I love you. For you have done such tremendous things for me. The Lord is my fort where I can enter and be safe. No one can follow me in and slay me. He is a rugged mountain where I hide. He is my savior, a rock, where none can reach me, and a tower of safety. He is my shield. He is like the strong horn of a mighty fighting bull. (laughs) All I need to do is cry to him. Say that back to me. All I need to do is cry to him. I don't care. Listen, I know some of you are in messes. Things are bad. You're in a pit. Things aren't going well right now in your life. But I'm trying to tell you what to do. Cry out to God and say, deliver me. He will lift us out. He says, all I need to do is cry to him. Oh, praise the Lord. And I am saved from all my enemies. Death bound me with chains and the floods of ungodliness mounted a massive attack against me. Trapped and helpless. I struggled against the ropes that drew me on to death. In my distress, I screamed out to the Lord. I screamed to the Lord for his help, and he heard me from heaven. My cry reached his ears. Then verse 16 says, He reached down from heaven and took me and drew me out of my great trials. He rescued me from deep waters. Listen, some of you are going to drown if you don't do what I'm trying to tell you to do. You got to learn to cry out to God. You got to learn that when you got a problem and when things are bad in your life, you got to learn to seek God, praise God, worship Him, cry out to God, and speak to the mountains. How many thinks I've ever been in trouble? How many thinks that I've ever been in a place where I had to cry out to God to get me out of it? And if you'll do this, see, I have an overwhelming confidence in my heart that God will deliver me. I have an overwhelming confidence and faith in Jesus Christ that if if I need something, if I need a way out, he will get me out. He reached down from heaven and took me and drew me out of my great trials. He rescued me from deep waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy. From those who hated me, I who was helpless in their hands, on the day when I was the weakest, they attacked. But the Lord held me steady. He led me to a place of safety, for he delights in me. Do you know why we won't cry out to the Lord when we get in trouble and things aren't going good? Because we don't think he loves us anymore. We relay, we relate his love with how good or how bad we've been. Do you, can I tell you that's not the way he loves us? Can I, can I tell you that's not how I love my kids? It, my love for them did not depend on how good they had been or how bad they had been. And God's love for you is not dependent on what you've done or what you haven't done. All he wants you to do is cry out to him. All he wants you to do is do what you know you need to do. And he will reach down and he will deliver you because he delights in you. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? I mean, I want you to hear that. Some of you struggle there so much, you know, you, you, you don't know he delights in you. Listen, God really likes me. He really does. He thinks I am a special guy. He loves me so much. And he loves you. And I don't care where you're at today or where you'll be tomorrow. I don't care what pit you find yourself, that the enemy snare worked, that his scheme worked, and you found yourself in the pit. It doesn't matter. If you will cry out to him and say, God, deliver me. Deliver me from the evil one. He is faithful and just. He did it for David, did he not? He did it for me, did he not? He's done it for you in the past, has he not? And he will do it today and tomorrow and forever because that's what he does. He is a loving Father, a mighty Lord, and a powerful Holy Spirit. 
Sometimes we find ourselves in bad times, bad situations, bad things happen to good people. We find ourselves in a trap. We find ourselves in a pit. But what the Bible is telling you and I to do today is that if we want to be delivered, then we cry out to God. We do what we're supposed to do, and we start speaking to the thing that's in our way. We start speaking to that mountain. Let me tell you, if you'll do that, you will find yourself overcoming some of the most incredible obstacles, things that you thought you would never be able to get out of, get over, or get through. I promise you, if you will start crying out to God and trusting in him and developing in your heart an overcoming mentality that you can defeat anything that the evil one throws at you, that you're going to serve God no matter what, and you're going to go on in life. If you will do that, I promise you, you will be delivered from every single enemy you'll ever have. See, I want you to go out of here today knowing that God delights in you. I want you to go out of here knowing that I don't care what you're going through, what mess you're in today or will be in tomorrow or down the road. It does not matter. God loves you. He delights in you. And you've got to learn how to pray. Deliver me. Deliver me. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. See, that's living in the kingdom. And that's what Jesus talks about on the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to be blessed. And you're going to have times where his scheme worked. You're going to have times where things went raw, raw and bad and south, and it was bad time. But I want you to know, he will deliver you. Let's pray. Father, Deliver us. Satan has such a scheme and a plan. But greater is he. Greater is that spirit of God in us than he that's in the world. And Father, I pray now. Lord, I know the people sitting right in this room today are going through horrific times. I know they need you to deliver them. And Father, I pray that we've said something to encourage them, to lift them. Lord, I know that others tomorrow are going to be facing things. Maybe sickness in their body. Maybe husbands and wives given problems. Maybe families. Maybe jobs. And Satan's snare will have worked. But Lord, you will deliver us from all of those enemies. And Father, I ask you now in Jesus' name to bless these people. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, listen.